play at some point, but we're not going to read it anyway. So you're going to be fine. You don't need to play at all. Um, yeah, and so I, and I'm working in the commercial music and jazz program. I'm running the jazz big band there. Uh, Dr. Fisher also runs the music and technology, music technology master's program, which is, yes, that's a thing, by the way. And if you're ever curious about something like that, that's something we're talking about in the, in the assistant teacher here. Um, but we have with us today um, our jazz combo that Dr. Fisher actually runs. Um, but they also get together and they play on their own and they do things in, in, either in, as a whole or um, in smaller groups. Um, and I'll just introduce them for you right now. We have Sam Hickman on alto saxophone, All Riley right. McMillan on sweet many, many I'm seeing the. <laughs> he doesn't know anybody. He's, uh, he's, he's forgotten all of you already. <laughs> oh, really? I don't know. There's a couple in the back that's acting like they knew you. But that's okay. Anyway. Mark. Uh, <laughs> Riley McMillan on trombone, Chris Spencer Alexander on guitar, um, Eliza Donlin on bass, and Joshua Perry on drums. Uh, they also perform with a singer, um, and she couldn't make it today. Her name is Harvest Cobb, uh, so if you ever see them out and about, they like to call themselves uh, Shrimp and Grits, because I guess Myrtle Beach, I don't know. Uh, but they have some tunes prepared for you, and, and they're going to play a little bit, so enjoy. Yeah. Hey, I'm Miss Grace. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. Thank you. 
Yeah, guys. say that it is a lot of communication between the two of us in particular, because you can think about it a little bit like the right hand and the left hand of the piano, like the left hand would typically be playing like a bass line or something of the sort, while the right hand's got all the nice, colorful notes in it. And that's the idea that we're trying to go for, being a backing for maybe these two guys, maybe, and maybe he's the one actually playing the melody as well. It, it all depends on the context, but that's the They're not changing at random spots in the in the form is the term you're using. That's a good term. 
they're waiting to see at the end when it repeats back, is Sam going to take another solo or is he going to stop in the next person? Exactly. So and even when Josh was soloing the drummer, so we did that. Josh, were you keeping track of the chord progression? The chord progression? Let's say the form. Oh, yeah. The yeah. number of bars. I used to sing the melody in my head. Well, right on. Yeah. That's it. I was sitting here counting along with him and keeping that cue, and you came out perfect. And the band knew all to come out at the end of the drum solo, didn't they? You also, he was also very clear about him and backing up, too. That's a good drummer. Yeah, there's a few things that you may have noticed. Like at the end of the solos, one, it starts to become a little bit simpler sometimes at the end of the solo. So it feels like it's kind of wrapping up. And also, like musically, I mean, melodically. But also, you probably noticed that there was some visual communication as well that was happening, right? Because nobody's reading music, so they, they have the freedom to kind of turn and look at each other and go, okay, your turn, right? And you probably noticed that as well. And the same thing was true with Josh. He kind of looked up and said, here we go, guys. What's going on now? Okay. All important skills to kind of catch when you're, when you're watching a band. And, and so, one, it's always fun to kind of be on the inside side of the circle a little bit, like, oh, now I understand what's happening, and that makes it more enjoyable to listen to, and two, you can use it to your advantage when, whenever you start to, do, um, to experiment with improvisation at some point in, in your ensemble. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, so sorry, go ahead, he had a point. Yeah. It, it's just basically like hitting the bass off with all the Is there a certain rhythm that you're hitting the bass off with? Um, Back or with? Well, a lot of things are, but like kind of with that last beat, like the bass off. Yeah, do you have something to add to that, Josh? Um, yes, I, I was, well, that last a hard time because jazz we know is an umbrella term and inside of jazz it's not just swing right there's like all kinds you can actually have any style inside of jazz what makes jazz jazz oh you, you have an answer I, I, that right? I, don't know, I, I guess it's really just the form as well as the improvisation and the So here, yeah, so here's my question. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna play devil's advocate here. Uh, Led Zeppelin. Is Led Zeppelin jazz? They have form in their songs, and they have improvised solos. Well, do they really have intonation? I don't even know what you mean. Well, yeah. Articulation. Articulation? Yeah, they have articulation, but maybe not in a swing feel, but we already said it doesn't have to be a swing. I'm being a jerk right now. So, so, so my point, my point in this is, yeah, this is, I'm being really rude. I'm sorry. Uh, my point is like, it, it kind of gets you thinking like, what, what makes it jazz? And there's not, there's no real great answer. But I think improvisation is super important. That's one of the things that makes it jazz. Um, the other thing that makes Led Zeppelin's form of improvisation different from what we just heard was interaction. That's a big part of it. 
And what do I mean by interactions exactly? I mean every time a soloist plays something, the rhythm section is listening and trying to communicate. It's a conversation. And you've heard that a lot, especially on the last one from Josh, right? During Raleigh's solo, Josh got pretty active sometimes. And he started playing on toms, and then he kind of dug in and did a little thing. He totally improvised that. And it was a direct reaction to what Raleigh was doing. In a rock setting, that's way less typical because it's all about keeping this, right? Or, or this, or, right? <laughs> it's all about that stuff, which is really important in those styles. In, this, in, a, in a jazz style, sometimes those things can be important, but oftentimes we like the interactions as well. So those are the two things that kind of set it apart, improvisation and interactions. And then our great jazz educator, um, drummer extraordinaire, drum, drum legend Joe LaBarbera told us that um, the third thing is innovation. And how I like to translate that for students and myself, because it's hard to be innovative, is try something new every time. It could be like this big, right? But just try to do something new that you hadn't done quite that way before every time you play. And all of a sudden it makes it sound like I feel like I can get more out of the uh, stick pedal when I don't have much to learn because I can actually feel it and move it rather than having to feel it with the surface. So, I, mm -hmm. I love that the bass player is asking that question because you know that we have to have like a really intimate relationship with our drummer. So, great question. Go ahead. Do you write your own music? Who are you talking to specifically? All of them. Oh, great question. Who's writing their own music in this band? Raise your hand. We were writing the other night, actually. Yeah. Uh -huh. Not what we wrote, but we were writing. There you go. The music they played today was part of the standard repertoire of jazz. So I could sit in on guitar and play this without ever rehearsing with them, and we could make music out of that. But also original composition. Balancing the tradition with innovation, like us playing a little bit. Yeah. Do, do you have an older brother? No. You just look like the bass player that was here like three or four years ago. Yeah. Oh, like I'm not this Aussie, you know, but I don't know. Yeah, I wonder if you're related. No, it's cool. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when you're walking a chord progression, how specifically is it? Is it important that you go over three themes? That's a really good question. Does uh, everybody understand the question before you answer it? Sorry, yeah, I just yeah. want to make sure we're all speaking. Because he's talking bass nerd totally. stuff. And so I get it, because I'm a total bass nerd. But do we know what that means, walking? Yeah. Someone might explain what walking means. Should I take a step back before I get a step forward? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So to, to walk a bass is to kind of, well, not kind of, is to give time underneath some sort of jazz standard, or not really just a standard. But for any kind of music, jazz in particular, in a swing, like in a swing feel, for example, you walk quarter notes because it's like a, it lines up nicely with the drum, it lines nicely up with the swing, and it allows people to play over it and give a solid foundation for the harmonic progression. So when people talk about walking bass lines, they're talking about quarter note bass lines in a swing feel. That's what you're talking about. Exactly. Quarter note bass lines in a swing. Yeah. So. Can you just play that for a second? Yeah, so uh, uh, maybe like on a blues. Okay, that would be
I know the progression. I know the chords that are being played underneath it. So, like, for example, I was playing D major, G major, and back to D. I know the notes that are in the chord. I can do a combination of walking chords, like the actual arpeggiations, which is what they're called, where you're just going like, or I can do a scalier approach where I'm actually going up the whole scale. And the idea is to kind of do it in a fashion that lines up the chords with one another in a in a walking fashion. So that feels like you're kind of going up and down like a hilly terrain. Yeah, I, I think if you want to get started, and by the way, playing walking bass lines on every instrument is an excellent way to get to know the chord progression. In other words, playing constant quarter notes in a melodic way over a specific set of chords is really hard and really rewarding once you learn how to do that. So this goes for everyone is what I'm getting at. And, and a really great way to get started is if you know a little bit about chords, then you'll start with the root of the chord on beat one. And beat three is the second most important beat in the measure, so you want some kind of chord tone on beat three, so the third or the fifth, for example, of the chord. And then beats two and four just connect between one and three. So you want to make some kind of smooth connection, whether, whether it ends up being an arpeggio, cool, but oftentimes it's really nice when it's like that scalar kind of thing, or even, if you want it to sound more like jazz, occasionally it's a chromatic thing, because that adds just more color. So, root on beat one, chord tone on beat three, fill in the rest with some kind of note that connects those notes together. That's a great way to get started on bass lines. Another good way is just to listen to the great Well, and then trans transcribe them, yeah, of course. That's but it, it's a never ending battle, man. Doing it for years, and I'm still, I still feel like some days, and I'm just, True. I'm back at square one. You and me both. Okay. You want to hear one more now that you're kind of like on the inside loop? Now you understand what's happening a little bit better, and you have like, oh, this is, this is what's happening. This is, this is what I'll be listening for. Oh, and and Dr. Fisher wants me to play, and he wants to play. It looks like. Yeah, I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> uh, so obviously no rehearsal. This is super fun. So you're going to see a lot of our playing communication.
and it's going to repeat every 12 bars. And just so you know, in jazz world, when we say chorus, that means one time through that 12 bar form. Okay? So we say one chorus, that's 12 measures. Two choruses, 24 measures. You understand what I'm saying? It's not like in pop music where it's like the hook. It's a little bit different. So 12 bars, this one set of pitches, five notes, are going to work over it. Pentatonic scale, so we call it five notes, five pentatonic pitch, tone, tone right? five notes, yeah. So we're going to start on B flat, count to B flat, let's hear your B flat. Ready? And. Then we're going to go for minor third. Ooh. Minor third from B flat. C short. Now for minor third from B flat. Ready? And. Come on in. 
That was cool.
you're, you're, you're so close. Who, who knows what he's talking about here? You're so close. You're just, you don't have the vocab word for it. That you haven't nailed it yet. Yeah, go ahead. Articulation. Articulation. That's the word you're looking for, which is when, I think you mentioned that last time when you were trying to describe what makes jazz sound like jazz. It's articulation. Yeah, it's articulation. The way he articulated the notes. In other words, where he decided to play, place the accents, right? And then the other thing you said was the rhythm. Let's talk about the rhythm. Like, is it the rhythm, or is it the time feel, or is it both? What do you think? Both? What? So you're telling me that like, if you play with good time, it sounds good? I mean, yeah, it is. It's a huge part. Yeah, that's the trick question, I guess, a little bit. Yeah, of course it does. So, what do you think jazz musicians spend a lot of time practicing with? A metronome. Because you need a good time feel. You need a good time feel in order for it to sound good and people can like it. We can talk about another really important thing that he made these three notes sound good with. There's something else in there. A tone. Like his sound. How many people like Sam's sound? Yeah. Yeah. How often do you work on your sound? Every day. Every day. What do you do to work on your sound every day? I do overtones, uh, I don't know. Good. Listening. 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 Who, what, so, and what do you do after you listen to them? Uh, transcribe them. Transcribe. In, order, in other words, try to copy them. Just try to copy other players. Like, exactly. Not just the notes they play, not just the rhythms they play, but their sound. Yeah? Long tones, I bet. Say that one five more times. Long tones. Long tones. Long tones. Uh huh. Long tones. <laughs> long tones. How many people are practicing long tones? To be honest. Come on. You have to. I know it's not exciting, but if you want to sound as good as Sam someday, it is the only way. If you want to sound as good as Raleigh someday, it is the only way. It is the only way. Yes. Do you do long tones? Do I do long tones on bass? Yes. So bass players, we have a couple ways we can play long tones. Electric bass is not as fun. I mean, but literally holding out the note and trying to sustain the pitch with the best sound I can, with the best articulation I can, great, that's fine. But with a bow is even better. I almost lost my girlfriend. <laughs> I sat there, this is when I was playing classical guitar, and I played a note, and I let it sustain, and she was in the kitchen, like, you know, making some food for herself or something, same note, over, 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 and she started, she just, at a certain point, broke, it was like, you need to stop playing that same note over and over and over again. I'm just sitting here like jolting every time it comes in, waiting for it to come in. And so then I never practice in front of her again. <laughs> That's the key. Don't practice your long tones, just don't do it in front of your partner. Yeah, don't. Or, or anybody, maybe. <laughs> Stand in a corner by yourself and just, yeah. So, so, in other words, if we simplify the pitches, so just three notes, or five notes, if you're comfortable with those five notes. Then the only thing you have to worry about is playing with good time, right? And playing with a good sound. And that seems pretty simple. Am I right? Yeah, you're making it up. I know that kind of complicates things a little bit. But the good news is you have a whole band backing you up. And you don't have to fill in all of the time that is being spent in that moment. You're, it, just because we call it your solo, just because we're going to call it your solo, doesn't mean you're literally <laughs> solo, right? It's not a classical saxophone recital. It's not solo. It's not solo, OK? It's a feature with the band. And what do we like about jazz? What's the thing that makes jazz jazz? What about it? What's the thing that I said? After improvisation. 
<laughs> what is it? Interaction. Interaction. So, in other words, we urge you to leave space. As a rhythm section, we urge you to leave space because that's how we get to interact with you, and that's part of the fun. That's part of the conversation. Just like I'm taking moments to listen to you guys and respond to what I have to say, it's the same thing. I'm not standing here talking by, my, by myself in this room. That would be weird. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's the same thing. And guess what? I'm improvising right now, too. Right? I, I, didn't, I didn't write down everything I'm saying. And in that same sense, you never have to do that, right, when you're, when you're playing music, because you never have to create the language. The language is already there, just like with words. You just have to take what you like from the language and play that. So in, in this circumstance, your language is three notes, maybe five notes, and then whatever rhythms that you're hearing in that moment and you get to try something new and leave some space for the for the rhythm section. Okay? Who's feeling great? Let me do this, actually. Here's, here's, so my rule is if you nominate someone else, that means you have to do it. So um, here's what we're gonna do. We're all gonna improvise together in the beginning. And it's gonna sound totally nuts, but keep listening, so don't play too loud. Keep listening so you can hear where the rhythm section is the whole time. That's my one copy out there. Okay? Thanks for being there. Here's the top. <laughs> Three or five, whatever you're comfortable with. Which question? These are good questions. Are we playing the song first? Or just starting the improv? We're going to start right on the improvisation for now. Excellent question. Uh, she asked if we were playing the melody first. Is that what you meant? Yeah, like this. Yeah. So we're gonna. So the form will be chord progression. Those twelve bars. We're always gonna be playing that, but the melody we're gonna leave out for now. We're gonna start right in improvisation. Everybody in, all together. It's gonna sound totally nuts. It's gonna sound crazy. Okay, here we go. One time through. Let's do one time through. One. Rhythm section is gonna keep playing though.
This is a judgment-free zone. We're all here to get better and have fun, right? Here's the melody. Let's do the melody two times through. Melody two times through. One, two, and then I'll point to you when it's time. One, what's your name? Lane. 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 Lane.
Thank you.